I'd like to think, good evening, hello, welcome, there it is, it's great to see everybody tonight and to invite you or to welcome you to our evening service. I suspect there are announcements I should make, uh, but I don't know what they are, so look at this and uh, look at the website and familiarize yourself with all that's going on here, that's our way of keeping you posted. And uh, I do have one announcement, I, and, I, and it's my fault. This morning, I talked about the Lord's Supper two times in my morning announcements and forgot to remind you, and I want to remind you again, that every time we have the Lord's Supper in the morning here, we offer it at 6 p.m. for those of you who were somehow detained from one of the services this morning or were teaching in a Sunday school and, or a catechism and were not able to be here for the Lord's Supper, you can come at 6 p.m. And, uh, and, you know, if you just say, I need more of Jesus and you want to come back for the 6 p.m. communion, you can do that too. So just know that happens whether we announce it or not. We had a great intimate group tonight and it was wonderful and you're invited to that on Sunday evenings at 6. Now, our catechism this evening is Westminster Catechism number 43, and it talks about the preamble to the Ten Commandments, which is that the Lord has brought us out of slavery. I want to read to you from Romans 6 why this is big news, great news. He says this, verse 20, When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But here's the good news. You ready for this? But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. And the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. The beginning of the preamble reminds us that these commandments that God has given to him are based on the foundation that he has freed his people from slavery. And that wasn't just for ancient Israel. That's your blessing tonight, that you are no longer slaves to sin, but you have been made slaves to God himself. And in that slavery, there is freedom and there is joy and there is everything that you're longing for tonight. So with that in mind, would you stand and I'm going to pray. And uh, we're going to begin our worship together. Our Father, in here tonight are friends who are living in slavery. Where do we begin? We are slaves to fear. We are slaves for approval from others. Some are bound by addiction tonight. Some are slaves to their lust. Some are slaves to money. Some, Father, uh, are in fear tonight because they are slaves to sin and feel uh, shame to come into your presence. But Father, you tell us that those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have trusted in Christ tonight, are no longer slaves to sin. We have been set free from that bondage. So we bring all of our baggage to you tonight all of our fears and all the things that uh, make us slaves, that sin that so easily entangles. And we say to you that we again acknowledge the freedom we have in Christ, the freedom to laugh and to dance and to sing and to enjoy all the good things that you have given us, the freedom to not live in condemnation or fear because we are your beloved sons and daughters, and the freedom even to not fear death. Because we know that you, Jesus, are the first fruits of all that awaits us in the resurrection. So we are so glad to be here, to be reminded that we have been set free from our slavery. And we are here tonight to worship you, our great God. We pray this in Jesus' name, and God's people said together, Amen. Oh, 
living breath Tis better far that I should walk by faith close to
Please be seated. On these Sunday nights during this testimony time, we want to brag on what the Lord is doing. And tonight, Micah Harriman with Campus Outreach is going to come and talk about what the Lord is doing through that ministry and uh, in the lives of students, college students in the CSRA in particular. State University. He went on something called the Summer Beach Project. He learned what it meant to lay down his life for the gospel. And uh, he came back and he was a completely different human being uh, than anything I had ever known him to be before then. So he started Bible study with me and some of my friends. And uh, for the first time in my life, I realized I wasn't who I thought I was. I wasn't a Christian. And that came through a verse in James 2, verse 19, uh, which says, You believe that there is one God who do well. <coughs> Even the demons believe and tremble. And so at that time, I realized I believed that there was a God, but I had this demon like faith that I only knew He existed. I said that I had a relationship with Him, but I really didn't. And so, through continued investigation, my brother walked with me every step of the way. And about a year later, uh, I gave my life to Christ um, through a verse that, that's very powerful to me. It's 2 Corinthians 5 14 and 15, which I think really describes what He did for me. It says, For the love of Christ, controls us because we have concluded this that one has died for all and therefore all have died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised and since then uh, I gave my life to Christ and I, I determined I wanted to live my life as someone that is controlled not by my will not by uh, my passion but by the love that Christ has for me and I wanted to constantly come back to that to know that that His love is what's going to motivate me um, to run my life. And so since then, I've gone on a few summer beach projects of my own. I got involved with Campus Outreach when I was a freshman in college. And probably the biggest thing that I've learned from Campus Outreach is, is just this word discipleship and this idea of making disciples and being a disciple of Christ. Probably the biggest thing that sold me on that, that Campus Outreach stresses over and over is this idea of life-on-life -life discipleship, living your life with somebody to show them how Jesus lived his life. And my brother did that with me for a few years. He moved back home his senior year so that we could have long rides to, to school together in the morning and he could share his faith, share the gospel with me and, and show me what it meant to be a Christian, what it meant to, to share my life with others. Since then, some other men in the church have done that. Luke Nide and Chris Drinkard have done a great job of continuing to do this thing, life on life discipleship with me and teaching me what it means to be a follower of Christ. But there was one verse that really sold me on this idea of discipleship, and it's shared with me by a friend of mine named James Doolittle. It's Isaiah 49.6, and it talks about how God didn't send Jesus just to save Israel. He didn't um, send him into this world just to bring back that nation, but to reach all nations. When he shared that verse with me about three years ago, I determined I didn't just want to be a disciple of Christ, but I wanted to be a disciple maker at Augusta State and wherever he called me to after that. So um, a little bit about what I'm doing now. I, like I said, I've been on a couple of beach projects. I've had the opportunity to invest my life in a lot of young men, and two in particular that are now investing their lives in others, and they are disciple makers themselves. Um, and probably the big thing uh, is another verse that has hit me really strong and has become a passion of mine is 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. It says, You then, my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This idea of entrusting what you've learned to faithful men, discipling what you know to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And since this, this verse, um, studying this verse about a year ago, I've decided to run track my senior year at Augusta State University. For no other reason than there's three men on that team that I believe are faithful men who will be able to teach others. And I believe that they will be men that if they experience the same life-on-life -life discipleship 
that God graced me to experience, then they will be disciple makers for a lifetime and there will be disciples on that track team long after I graduate this spring. So I want to thank uh, this First Pres family for all your constant support of campus outreach, your constant support of young people and people like me who get the opportunity to be discipled by great godly men and how it's changed my life and uh, lives of my friends to be disciple makers through all, all the nations. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we're going to pray for campus outreach as, uh, and the, these members of the Forest Hill Parish tonight and uh, also for our evening offering. So if the ushers would come forward this time, we'll do our offering. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did not wait for us to try to find you, but you came to seek and to save that which was lost through your son Jesus. Thank you that you found Micah, and that now Micah is modeling or mirroring the work of Christ in finding others. Would you teach us as a congregation how to, to be disciples as adults and disciple makers as adults and as children and as college students and people well into their years? Would you teach us how to seek and save the lost in our places of business and in our neighborhoods and in our affinity groups? Father, we want to be a church that is like the church in Acts, where daily you were adding to our number those who were being saved. We thank you for how you are doing that, and we just ask for more of your blessing. Would you pour out your spirit in that? In particular, we pray to that end for the Forest Hills Parish and these members, for Josh Dunn, for Sally and George Inman, for George Elizabeth, for Lauren and Stephen Martin, for Nina and Alex McCauley, and Nina and Sibley and Anders, and for Lucianne and Bill McCartney, and Will, Drew, Sam, and Luke. We pray, Father, that these would be salt and light, and that generations from now would call you blessed, Father, because they were reached through the ministry of, our, of these families and through all of our parishes, through all of the ministries of this church. And it's to that end that we give. And we pray that we, Father, that you would take these gifts, and uh, whether meager or great, and that you would use them to advance your kingdom, to build your church, not only this church, but all churches in the CSRA and uh, the, our country and the world that are preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Would you cause all your churches to flourish? And we thank you for the privilege of giving. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 144. Continue our rapid march through the Psalms over the course of eight years. And uh, here we are, the 144th. Another Psalm of David. And yet, you will uh, probably recognize a number of the things that are said in this Psalm because there's very little of it that's original. It's only verses 11 through 15 or so that are brand new to us. The rest we've seen in other psalms, in five other psalms to be exact, in Psalm 8, Psalm 33, Psalm 102, Psalm 103, 104. And it's because uh, David says the same thing over and over again, and he says the same thing over and over again because we need to hear it again and again, that we do live in a dangerous world. We have spiritual enemies, our faith fails, but God is faithful. In fact, He is perfect in His faithfulness and provides everything that we need for life and godliness. Let's read it with, with a great expectation of comfort as he writes beginning in verse 1. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, he is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer, my shield in whom I take refuge, 
who subdues peoples under me. O Lord, what is man that you care for him, the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, his days are like a fleeting shadow. Part your heavens, O Lord, and come down, touch the mountains so that they smoke. Send forth lightning and scatter the enemies, shoot your arrows and rout them. Reach down your hand from on high, deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. I will sing a new song to you, O God, on the ten-stringed lyre, I'll make music to you, to the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David from the deadly sword. Deliver me and rescue me from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. Then our sons in their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed are the people of whom this is true. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Let us pray. Oh Lord, please open our eyes to see you high and lifted up, and may it be true that everyone who leaves this place this evening would leave with these words on his or her lips, I am blessed because God is my Lord. Our world is in tumult, Father. It's not a new thing, but it seems so much more immediate to us and so much more threatening to us because the news is instant. Walls have been breached. Security has been threatened. And those who look to earthly rulers are dismayed. We thank you, O Lord, that you, our Lord, are the King. Help us to live in it as a result of studying this passage this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said together, Amen. This afternoon I was listening to a classical, a classic debate. It's called the great debate because it is the great debate over the existence of God. It's a rather famous debate now between a theologian who at the time was pastoring a church and was a past professor at Reformed Theological Seminary. His name is Greg Bonson. He died at an early age. And the man that he was debating, Gordon Stein, also died at an early age. In fact, he died, I think, about 12 years after that debate. Gordon Stein was an atheist and was a great leader in the free-thinking movement or the atheist movement that is becoming popular again, college campuses and, and um, young people across the country. Now, there's nothing really new that I heard in that uh, debate But what struck me afresh is how sad it is what Gordon Stein was arguing for, what Gordon Stein had devoted his life to. Here was a brilliant man, a PhD in science, he was arguing, he'd spent the last part of his life arguing across the country that God does not exist, or at least it's impossible to prove that He exists, He argued against and found great satisfaction in debunking what he calls spiritual hoaxes. I thought uh, as I was uh, listening to that debate today, I wonder how this man ended. I wonder what his final days were like. I wonder if he's still alive. I found that he, was, that he died just a few years after that debate, and I read uh, his eulogy that was at some kind of free-thinking chapel And uh, there were excerpts uh, about his life. They were brief. The service was brief. There wasn't a lot to say. Uh, They recounted his achievements, like his PhD dissertation on the uh, maternal instincts of the dolphin. And, um, And then they recounted his field trips that he had taken to various places in the country, debunking spiritual hoaxes, and held him up as a man that had trumpeted the cause of free thinking 
and had stood against the lies of theism for the latter part of his life. And that was the end of the service. It was terribly sad to think about a man who had given his life to the idea there is no God. And not just to the idea that there is no God, but in dismissing the possibility of God, he dismissed this God. This God, the God of the Bible, the God revealed in Jesus Christ, who provides what our hearts desperately long for. We desperately long for someone to protect us, for someone who is more powerful than we are, someone who loves us, to be near to us, especially in times of need and especially at the end of life. And we all in our heart of hearts desire to praise someone greater than ourselves, to live for something that is bigger than we are, that is bigger than our empty world. Gordon Stein faced the last days of his cancer without any of these comforts. No idea of a protector. No idea of someone, a God, a gracious God who could be with him. And no idea, or at least the denial of the idea, that there was someone greater than himself to praise. Now you may not believe in that God this evening. You may not trust in his Son But you will hear how great he is just by virtue at least of reading this psalm as we have done and hopefully by expounding on those great attributes of God revealed personally in Jesus Christ. He is, first of all, and again, there's nothing new about these thoughts. We've talked about them over and over again as we studied the Psalms. And if you don't, even, if you don't need it tonight, you will need it someday. You need to know that God is your protector. And God provides absolute and infallible protection. That's what the first several verses, the first two verses are about. He is our infallible protection. We know it several ways, not only because he describes himself as an aggressive protector and a defensive protector, but he describes himself by seven titles. We know from Scripture that the number seven is the, is the symbol of perfection. Seven different titles in just these early verses he describes himself by in order to convey to you that there is no enemy that can overtake you because he, if, if he is your protector in Christ. He is your aggressive protector. Now he uses this word, he uses a title for himself in a different way from what we have seen already in our study. We have encountered this name or this uh, metaphor of God as a rock, praise be the Lord, my rock. We've encountered that several times, especially in Psalm 18. And we said, and I'm sure you remember this well when we studied Psalm 18 about five or six years ago, uh, that uh, God, when He calls Himself a rock, uh, when, when He identifies Himself as a rock, Uh, has, there are several different nuances to that image, and all of them are seen in Psalm 18. One is he's a shade. And so the Middle Easterner loved rocks in the desert because you could get on the leeward side of them and find some relief from the sun and the heat. Another is a rock is a shelter, a shelter in the storm. Rock of ages, cleft for me. And thirdly, a rock is a foundation. Blessed is the man who builds his house on the rock. Well, here is an image, uh, a, a, a sense that he uses, he uses rock here in a sense we haven't encountered before. Here it's a kind of military academy. We're going to study it when we get to Genesis, but I want you to look at it very quickly First of all, because it's fresh in our minds, the study of Joseph, Genesis chapter 49. It's the only other place in the Bible that I know of where this, this, uh, this sense in which rock is a kind of military academy is used. Genesis chapter 49, verse 23, as Jacob is giving out his blessings to his sons, he says, with bitterness, archers attacked Joseph. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady, his strong arm stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd 
the rock of Israel. It's the same way he uses it here. It is that Joseph is described as one who went to this rock and he learned how to do battle. He said uh, they shot arrows of bitterness at Joseph. We've encountered those arrows of bitterness, haven't we? The, the betrayal and the and the persecution of his brothers, the, the injustice he ex- experienced in Egypt. They shot these arrows. He didn't encounter any physical battle. He was not in any battles like David was. But he experienced the bitter, fiery darts of the evil one. And by going to God who is the rock, we're told by the psalm, by by Jacob, by going to the God who is the rock, he was able to fight those enemies. David says, here is the same thing I've experienced from you. You have trained me by constantly going to you, by constantly returning to you as the rock of my life, I have learned how to defend myself against bitter enemies. I have not become bitter because I've kept my eyes On you. God is the aggressive warrior who trains your hands for battles. But he is also your defensive warrior. See in verse 2 He is my loving God and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, in whom I take refuge, who subdues peoples under me. Now, you remember last week we were studying Psalm 143, and we said in, these, in, those, uh, in that first verse of Psalm 143 are three stars of the covenantal constellation, that those three attributes of God, His mercy, His faithfulness, and His righteousness, describe the essence of who He, are, who he is, and everything in those attributes provides everything that you need. Now, two of those attributes are mentioned here. He is my love, he says literally, or he is my mercy, and he is my shield, which is to say, he is my shield of faithfulness. He is my love. He is the one who loves me, and he cannot love me. He cannot love me any more. He cannot love me any less because he loves me perfectly in Christ. No one can add to my life. No one can detract from my life. I am completely filled up by the love of God in Christ. He is my love. He is my shield, the shield of my faithfulness. Remember we talked about the the armor of God in Ephesians 6 and that the armor is the armor of God that is applied to you. And one of the most important pieces of armor is His shield of faithfulness over your spiritually vital organs. And it's His faithfulness that protects you. It's only a step away to recall the third attribute, which we're surely to remember. He is also our belt of truth. He is our righteousness. God is your aggressive protector. He is your defensive protector. He provides for you love and faithfulness and truth. No one, you will live in an impregnable spiritual fortress. No one can destroy you. Even if they kill your body, you will live forever because you live in Christ who is covenantally faithful. I was uh, struck a number of years ago when I was preaching on this psalm. And a dear old saint in the congregation I came from, Covenant Church, uh, a woman who probably had much of the Bible memorized, she walked very closely with the Lord. And uh, I felt like when I would look at uh, people like her, I would think, what in the world? What in the world am I contributing to her spirituality? She knows the Lord more greatly than I will ever know Him, but... We just kept plowing through the Word. We were preaching. I was, I was uh, preaching uh, the Psalms uh, at the time, and we came to Psalm 144, and she had just been diagnosed with cancer, and they said, you don't have very long to live, there's no treatment for this cancer, and uh, you will die in a matter of months. And she came up to me after studying this very Psalm, 
and making points similar to this about these attributes of God. And she said, you know, it's studying the Psalms. It's in studying the Psalms that I've been prepared to die. I'm prepared for this cancer. Now, I'm sure there were days when she thought, this isn't really relevant to me. I couldn't be happier. My children walk with the Lord. My, my grandchildren walk with the Lord. I'm happily married. I have a meaningful a service to perform, what, what, could, what could there possibly be? What application could there be for me in this psalm? But as she stored up these truths through the months and years, she was ready for that last battle. Are you? You can't be ready on your own. You can only be ready as you were able to say, I am blessed because God is the Lord and He is infinitely great. He is true. He is faithful. He is my righteousness. He is my love. He's your protector. Not only is He your protector, He is with you. If Christ is your Savior, He is not only your protector, He is with you. Now, He makes this point to us. Not just in this psalm, but in the course of psalms that we are studying at this section of the Psalter. We've been building up to this point. Here in Psalms 144 through 147, he will, uh, the psalmist will show us the, the inadequacy of man, that you are inadequate to face the spiritual and physical and emotional enemies that lie ahead of you. You do not have the resources to face them on your own. Uh, but he has only come to this point of showing us our insufficiency after showing us the all-sufficiency of God. Now, let me just recall them to you very quickly. In Psalm 135, we understood that God is our warrior. Psalm 136, His love is enduring. Psalm 138, He remembers us. 139, He never leaves us. 140, He is strong. 141, He delivers us. And 142, we saw that He is faithful and righteous and true. And against that bright backdrop of God's all-sufficiency, now the psalmist begins to say, now here is how inadequate you are. You have no strength in your own, of your own to face your enemies. Now that is humbling and it's daunting. But when you are so humbled, and only when you are so humbled, will you become strong and confident. Look at how the psalmist describes it very tenderly in verses 5 through 8. He says, Part your heavens, O Lord, and come down, touch the mountains so that they smoke. Here is this one whom God has said has no strength. You have no adequacy in and of yourself. This one, this speck of dust, turns to God and says, part those heavens and come down and help me. How can he make such a bold request? Because he knows the attributes of his God. He knows that God has effectively welcomed that kind of request. I want you to ask me that. Because I am your love, I want you to ask me to part the heavens and move heaven and earth to come and help you. He goes on, verse 6, send forth lightning and scatter the enemies. Shoot your arrows, rout them, reach down your hand from on high, deliver me and rescue me from the mighty waters, from the hands of foreigners whose mouths are, whose mouths are full of lies, whose right hands are deceitful. What is your enemy tonight? Who is it? What is it? What do you think is insurmountable? What is eating your spiritual lunch? What has you so discouraged? What is your besetting sin? Why do you endure with it as an enemy, as a discouragement? Is it because you have forgotten that God has said, I am your love? Call to me. I'll part the heavens and come and be with you. I am with you, even to the end of of the age. It is the Emmanuel principle of Scripture that God is with us. He proves it in Jesus Christ. John G. Payton, I've mentioned to you on numerous occasions, a great missionary, heroic missionary to 
the New Hebrides, um, uh, now uh, Vanuatu. And uh, went to the, at the time he went there, there were cannibals and headhunters, and now there's a very vibrant church in Vanuatu. In fact, the, the, um, the history of the, the spread of the gospel in that country is very interesting and very dramatic. You may want to look it up sometime. But John Payton went there without any help, without any other person, without any other uh, spiritual encourager. He went there on his own to lead people to Christ, not knowing if he would ever live or come back to his native Scotland. And while he was there, he lost his wife and his child. He buried them with his own hands and had his own service. He said, during the crisis, I felt generally calm and firm of soul, standing erect and with my whole weight on the promise, lo, I am with you always. Precious promise. How often I adore Jesus for it and rejoice in it. Blessed be his name. He wrote that in his journal after he had buried his wife and his child. Shortly after that, in 1862, there was a tribal war that broke out all across the island. And um, he was surely going to be a focus. He was going to be one of their victims. But a friendly chief named Nowar uh, hid him in a chestnut tree, put him up in the thick foliage of it. And he said, remain here. Don't move. You stay here. And all night long. Uh, the tribal warriors were hacking around that tree, hacking through the foliage in the middle of the night, trying to find uh, John Payton in particular. He was terrified as he waited there through the night. This is what he had to say. I often felt my brain reeling, my sight coming and going. You know how that is. You're so scared. Your sight goes in and out. My sight coming and going, my knees smiting together when, the, when thus brought face to face with a violent death. Still, I was never left without hearing that promise coming up through the darkness and the anguish and all its consoling and supporting power. What was that promise? Lo, I am with you always. God through Christ is your protector. God through Christ is the one who is with you at all times and in every situation. And God through Christ is the only one, therefore, who is praiseworthy. The only one who is significantly bigger than you, than the emptiness of your life, the emptiness of this world. The one, the only one who is, who is so praiseworthy that people have been willing to die for him through the ages. Uh, the psalmist says, David says in verse 9, I will sing a new song to you, O God, on the ten-stringed lyre. I will make music to you. There are several occasions in the Old Testament when, this, when the, the Old Testament writer describes the new song. But it's only in the New Testament that we get the words, the lyrics to the new song. It's in Revelation 5. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. To receive honor and glory and power. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. That is the new song. That is the song that um, Isaac Watts is alluding to in the hymn that we uh, just heard uh, Carly sing so beautifully. No more, my God, I boast no more of all the duties I have done. No more, my God, no more. I boast no more. I boast in no one and nothing except the lamb who was slain. He is my everything. He is my righteousness. He is my love. He is my faithfulness. Donald Gray Barnhouse, famous pastor in the, in the 30s through 50s. He was a very bold man. He had a very uh, bold, even brash personality. He was a courageous Evangelist. He is the one actually who invented evangelism explosion. It's just James Kennedy, who was led to Christ by Donald Gray Barnhouse, who, who put all of that together into kind of a formula. But Barnhouse would use those questions all the time. Uh, uh, if you were to die tonight, are you sure you would go to heaven? And then if you were to 
uh, die and go to heaven and appear before God and he were to ask you, what, uh, why should I let you into my heaven, what would your answer be? Barnhouse used that question, those questions uh, all over the world, led many to Christ. On one occasion, he was going through a hospital. He's visiting a hospital. He went into a man's room. He didn't know the man. And uh, he asked him, uh, if you were to die tonight, he's not especially sensitive to somebody in the hospital. He didn't know his diagnosis, but he, hey, uh, sir, I don't know you. You don't know me, but I have a question to ask you. If you were to die in just a few minutes, would you go to heaven? And the man said, oh, I should think I would answered very proudly, oh, well, uh, why do you think you would? He said, because I am an honorable man. I'm a good man, and I belong to the lodge down the street, and we do good things. And uh, Barnhouse said, uh, well, do you know the words to the new song? If you're going to heaven, you better be ready because you're only going to be singing one hymn, and you better know the words to it. Well, what is the, well... What are the words? The words are, he said, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Not worthy am I to be here. It's worthy is the lamb that was slain. Well, he mocked Barnhouse and, and uh, dismissed him from his room. Barnhouse somehow or another learned later that the man was dying. And uh, he was uh, in uh, a room, I guess the hospital room, and, and his lodge brothers were there to keep watch for him. It was their tradition, you know, that they would, they would watch. I don't know what they're watching for, but they were there with him, and they're, they're watching, and they would take turns watching, uh, 24 hours a day watching. And so Barnhouse came in and said, do you mind if I take a shift watching? And they assumed that he was another member of the lodge, and the guy got up and left, and Barnhouse sat down. And uh, the man opened one eye and looked at him, and Barnhouse said, I hope you don't mind me sitting with you. I just want to see how a good man dies. And you've said that you are good and you have confidence in your goodness, and so I'm just, if you don't mind, I'm just going to sit here and watch you. I'm going to watch you die. See your confidence dying on your own goodness. Well, this man was already, this man was terrified of dying. None of his brothers could help him. The ones who were telling him how good he was, don't worry about it, you're going to be okay. And he said to Barnhouse, you would not mock a dying man, would you? Barnhouse said, I would never mock a dying man. But I would tell a dying man the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, which can assure you of eternal life after death. And please tell me that. He explained to him the good news. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb alone who was slain for us and provides us truth and righteousness and faithfulness. This is the one who is promised to be your infallible protection even into eternity. This is the one who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you even to the end of the age. This is the one who alone is worthy of of praise. Would you come to him afresh this evening? Let's pray together. <clears throat> the Lord, the psalmist says, in a section I didn't even get to, the psalmist says that there are all kinds of blessings that a Christian receives in this life. He knows the happiness of family and the joy of meaningful work. He has hope for the future. But uh, the psalmist also says that though these things will pass away, this remains, that the Lord is great. The Lord is great and will never fail us. He will never pass away. No matter what happens in our world internationally, no matter what happens in our world privately, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever is our Savior and our Lord. Would you, O oh Lord, f freshly encourage us this evening. Make us bold and brave ambassadors who would seek occasions to live and to tell others about this refuge that we have 
and our faithful Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray, amen. Everyone, please stand, sing to the one who's worthy. with your hands for his blessing. The psalmist says, God is, God is your rock, and blessed are the people for whom this is true. Blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Go forth in that peace and power. Amen. Amen.